Wonderful. So uh, a very warm welcome uh, to everyone uh, joining us uh, to this uh, presentation of the uh, Masters in Architectural Conservation here at the University of Kent. I'm the uh, program director, uh, Nicolas Karidis, and uh, I'm very pleased to see my colleagues, uh, uh, the tutors in the program. Um, would you like to introduce yourselves, uh, starting from Fiona? Oh yes, good morning. Um, I'm Fiona Rayleigh and I am a lecturer in architectural design and conservation uh, as part of the school. I'm a point three position, so I do about one, uh, one and a half days a week. And I'm running a practice and historic building consultancy in Canterbury, working in London and right across the southeast, um, and also chair of the RIBA conservation group. And I'm a SPAB guardian at the moment, which on the technical education and training committee. Thank you very much, Fiona. Hey, Ron. Hello, I'm Ronald Yee. I'm a lecturer at Kent University and I uh, teach on coordinate technology uh, uh, through the undergraduate course and through this master's course. Ron and Manolo. Hello, good morning. Uh, nice to see you all. My name is Manolo Guerci. I uh, wear various hats in the school where I've been for the past 15 years. I manage the BA Architecture Part 1, but I also teach uh, across the curriculum. Uh, my specific expertise is within history, theory and heritage. And in that respect, I also work as a heritage consultant for a firm in London, which in fact, the collaboration of which, uh, the which collaboration came out of a, 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 a kind of a report that began uh, with uh, uh, an architect, a student that uh, took this uh, this uh, this uh, course. Uh, Nikas and I, all those years ago, uh, really uh, put this thing together. Nikas managed the whole thing, and I created what is the first module that students coming into this course take, which is really to do with the theoretical, cultural, and philosophical infrastructure as to why we do what we do. So uh, that's me, and I look forward to seeing you uh, in September. Thank you very much, Manolo. Um, we'll and a few words about the structure of today. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the program. Uh, it's uh, trying to highlight its key characteristics. And this will be followed by individual presentations of each of the modules of the programs by the conveners themselves. Um, and we will uh, close with uh, uh, Q&A, any questions you may have, we are here to answer them. So uh, without fur further ado, let's uh, start. Um, uh, let me start with the introduction to the program, uh, sharing the screen, and hopefully you can all see my presentation here. Let's minimize this. So um, I'd like to use this presentation to give you some of the key characteristics of our program, perhaps those characteristics that distinguish it from other programs. So one of the things that make us here in Kent unique is our location. Location is of paramount importance when you're studying conservation because many of the things you learn, you learn them from buildings that can serve as case studies. Uh, it is through your experience and explorations of buildings that you can build up your knowledge of conservation. Therefore, proximity to historic buildings is of importance. And in this respect, our program is, um, is fortunate to be located in Kent. Uh, and I say Kent in particular because this county uh, in the southeast of England provides easy access to a heritage that is not only important and significant, but it's also immersive. This heritage has the form of some of the most beautiful towns in uh, certainly in the UK, even internationally. Uh, towns like uh, Rye, like Sandwich, uh, Rochester, Margate, offer the opportunity to engage with buildings by using them. This is a heritage that's very much in use. Um, you can experience this heritage within uh, its, in many cases, its original urban setting, which is also very rich and varied. So it's not only an opportunity to explore interesting buildings, but also to live, uh, to engage with them, to internalize the experience um, that is offered through those cities. Um, 
more specifically, we are on our doorstep, we have the historic city of Canterbury and its UNESCO World Heritage Site, which offers an invaluable opportunity to engage with very complex medieval buildings, but not only medieval, uh, because Kent has a very varied heritage at the same time. Uh, there is uh, cities like Rochester, of course, are known for, for their medieval heritage, but not far from us in Margate, you can see some wonderful examples of early 20th century modernist architecture, uh, illustrated here with the Dreamland Cinema in its uh, state, in the state it was uh, in the uh, early 2000s before it was refurbished uh, we, in, in an admirable way that you can observe today. So from our heritage, the heritage of Kent ranges from ancient structures, uh, medieval structures, Georgian. Uh, it provides a very good representation of all the major uh, architectural developments uh, in the UK and helps you gain a very varied understanding of conservation and architectural history. So this access to this varied and rich and immersive heritage is one of the key characteristics of our program. Uh, the other, um, I think, important aspect of the program is that it's based within the University of Kent. And in this respect, by studying in this program, you form part of a very rich student culture, which is supported, of course, by the resources that are made available by the university. We are using an excellent library, Templeman Library, that has uh, an ever-expanding conservation and architectural history section, but there are also other activities which are essential to the experience of someone studying conservation, uh, from activities to all the kinds of administrative support networks that a well-organized university provides. So we are very, very fortunate to be part of the University of Kent and indeed um, to be um, accommodated within uh, the Kent School of Architecture and Planning. Um, the other characteristic now of the program has to do with the way we approach the topic of conservation. Uh, and in this respect, we what distinguishes us is uh, our emphasis on the design of historic sites, intervention at historic sites, we are not limited to uh, the theoretical analysis or the uh, theoretical understanding of preservation methods and techniques, but we look also at uh, reconstruction methods, restoration methods, all the gamut of intervention procedures affecting the historic sites. We think that there's a great deal to be learned in every one of these fields, and there's a great demand for uh, skills and knowledge uh, in aspects such as reconstruction and restoration. We have uh, developed this expertise responding to local needs. We've seen that there are many, uh, mainly medieval, but also early modern monuments uh, around us in Kent that require adaptive reuse. So they require a very uh, um, specific range of skills that are relevant to uh, conservation and reconstruction. So we are trying to provide our students with some of these skills and we prepare them to be uh, to with all the skill set necessary to make a positive contribution to the future of historic sites. The way to achieve this, of course, is by uh, projects that give a hands-on understanding of conservation. And you cannot deliver those without collaborations with um, those who manage important historic sites. So another distinctive aspect of the program is since the beginning, since the inception of the program, we have collaborated with Canterbury Cathedral and more recently Purcell Architects uh, who are uh, surveying the fabric of the cathedral and also are preparing um, the design, the conservation the cathedral. They're involved in almost all the conservation projects affecting Canterbury Cathedral. This collaboration enables our students not just to visit the cathedral and to be guided through it, but it gives them access to um, the uh, conservation sites themselves. So we had the opportunity to observe uh, very closely the recent conservation works affecting the south transept wall and the vaults. So that involved access to the scaffolding and a close observation of the conservation in progress. Um, more recently, uh, we have collaborated since 2019, we have been collaborating with the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings 
a very important uh, historic conservation society here in the UK, but with international influence. As you may know, it was founded by William Morris. Um, it is at the forefront of conservation, um, usually provided very, very high quality advice, but also it's, it's a society that's directly involved in the conservation of historic buildings, selected historic buildings here in the UK. One of those is St. Andrew's Chapel in Maidstone, a medieval and early modern building with many faces that evolve, that um, um, are adjacent to a medieval chapel. Um, and this live project gave our students the opportunity to learn from the work carried out by the SPAB technicians uh, on site. Um, uh, for us, for instance, this, this image shows we had the opportunity to look at the conservation of a wide range of structures, for instance, uh, to go uh, into detail uh, about the techniques of repointing, uh, learning about the materials and all the relevant skills. This is all part of our emphasis on hands-on skills and methods. Uh, the other aspect of the program is brought by our students themselves, because this is a varied student cohort. We are open to applicants from diverse backgrounds, including art history, archaeology, planning, we had filmmakers, uh, specialists in object conservation. Uh, we think that this is one of our great strengths of the program because people from different disciplines can actually um, engage with each other and uh, mutually educate each other by providing their own view, their own different view. And this is what enriches discussions uh, that take place during the course's seminars. So I hope that this gives you an introductory idea of the program. Um, it's uh, the structure for a full-time student is as illustrated here. We start with the autumn term that provides uh, a theoretical understanding of the basis, the foundational principles of conservation and its planning framework and the policies affecting it with two modules, conservation principles, which is convened by my colleague Manolo Guerci, and uh, a, a module entitled Conservation in Action that focuses on the legislative and planning framework, which is convened by my colleague uh, Fiona Rayleigh. Uh, in the spring term, we go more technical, um, so uh, focusing on uh, intervention methods of intervention at historic buildings, involving usually the design of an intervention project, and of course, the structural appraisal, um, the structural aspect of conservation, which is convened by my colleague Ron Yi. So I'd like to uh, close this presentation by inviting now my colleagues perhaps um, uh, to, to, to give a more detailed presentation of uh, those modules. So perhaps we can start with uh, uh, my colleague Manolo Guerci, who can provide an overview of, uh, of the module entitled Conservation Principles. So Manolo, over to you. Thank you, Nikos. I hope you can hear me. I think here in the school, the network was a little bit um, shaky. Uh, so thank you for this introduction. And I'm now going to share my screen and offer a very brief overview of uh, what I do uh, with the introduction to the theoretical and uh, philosophical framework. Can you all hear me and can you see my screen? Very clearly, Manolo, thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, we do, as you heard, uh, have intervention at an object, a building, uh, uh, anything concrete, if you like, as our end a product, the cycle ends with it because we are concerned with space, with the built environment and with any object that is part of it. But the very first question that we should all ask ourselves, no matter what background you come from or what previous knowledge you may have, is the why. Because this is a fundamental question around which the whole debate as to how that finished project ends up being uh, uh, really centers. So I start, the whole of my module explores theoretical attitudes and cultural backgrounds and contexts around this question, why we preserve 
and why it matters. You may think that this is an obvious question or a rhetorical question, but you'd be surprised as to how much in fact it isn't and how open a question it is. And therefore, how um, wild, if you like, uh, the whole context of dealing with heritage uh, 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 is. Uh, I won't uh, go into uh, all of these, but uh, uh, basically what I wanted to say by including this few slides with text was that the, the, the kind of breaking down of the why is to do with lots of things. So it's a very multi-layered, complicated question. One is to do with the use of a building. And I use here uh, one of the words in Latin that the uh, ancient Roman uh, scholar and writer and architect uh, uh, Vitruvius uh, uses to describe what architecture is, you see. And so one of the three main points is to do with what do we do with it, the use. And the word utilitas has got many implications. Um, now, we also need to bear in mind in uh, dissecting this question, this why we do it, um, a fundamental thing which is really important to stress at the very beginning, and that is that what we do is nothing to do with a kind of preset formula. Yes. So there isn't a, an algorithm uh, that tells you what to do because every single object has got a different uh, uh, story. And so Every decision raises a whole set of questions that we also uh, uh, go through in this uh, introductory uh, uh, module, because, of course, attitudes towards restoration change with context, time, individuals, uh, geographical locations and needs. It's also important to bear in mind when we tackle this question, uh, something to do with what we call things and what names mean. Because if we think about restoration, we have to bear in mind that that is a word with added components. And one is to do with preserving, and that has got its own meanings. And another is to do with conserving, which also has its meanings and implications. Preserve is to maintain is to preserve as well as retain. So you can see here, without me going into details, how different philosophies and principles really affect what it is that we do. So going back as to the components of the why we preserve, there is uh, something else to bear in mind, which really makes uh, the relationship to an actual object building or uh, or, 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 or any anything really concrete a uh, very uh, key. So we spoke about the fact that he, the, the, the utility, the, the fact that the, the scope uh, is an important part as to why we preserve. The other, of course, going along with what uh, Vitruvius described architecture to be, is to do with beauty in it, the widest possible meaning. We preserve things because of the intrinsic value to do with beauty. And when some of those categories come together, then you create that object that is defined as a work of art. And uh, tackling even that question, what is a work of art, is another very interesting thing that we deal with. Now, there are some uh, uh, buildings that obviously fit rather nicely within all of those categories. They are celebratory, they are rare, they are commemorative, they are exemplary iconic and poetic. In other words, they are works of art. And at this point, as we speak, there is no question as to why we preserve buildings such as this one. And of course, the one you see there is uh, is perhaps quintessentially the epitome of uh, Western architectural culture uh, 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 and symbol of democracy in the wide sense, the Parthenon uh, uh, on the Acropolis Italians. Which, of course, by the way, if one uh, then concentrates on the building, it's a building that has been under restoration for as long as I can remember. And, and it all started well before I was born. And it's been pretty constantly under restoration. And so it's it's seen so many different attitudes. And also, if you think, what is it that we are preserving and why, then the building itself has got several days of history. There it is. And here is a close up 
And of course, one such layer is to do with the political components and what has happened to the building all the time. And I don't need to dwell at any length on the everlasting debate, which uh, recently has taken uh, a, a different innuendo, perhaps, of the uh, marbles that were removed from uh, the building, moved uh, in very controversial circumstances to London, where they are in the British Museum. But of course, meanwhile, uh, Athens, uh, over the last 20 years or so, uh, built its own repository for this thing. Here is a close up of the top part of the Acropolis Museum in Athens. And there you see it. And there you see it. Uh, and so the question is, why do we preserve? What do we preserve? And who preserves it? Uh, and this is a very, very uh, contested question, which really is now expanding towards so many other categories of museum collections around the world in terms of ownership and geographical appropriateness when it comes to preserving certain things. Now, we don't only talk about buildings so iconic or so ancient, if you like, as the likes of the Parthenon, but we also dwell uh, uh, with uh, contemporary or near contemporary, certainly within the 20th century at large. Another building that certainly nowadays falls within the iconic and poetic in a way you could argue is the 20th century version of that temple. It's the Villa Savoie, which you see now restored. But that villa not long ago after the war was down for demolition. And uh, the whole debate as to why and what and what elements do we have to preserve what we nowadays perhaps think uh, um, as objects to be preserved without question is something that has been built up and it's still very much debated today. The Villa Savoie has not arguably been demolished, but the whole area uh, over the valley of the Seine has been redeveloped. And so, in fact, it is, apart from the object itself, completely unrecognizable. Um, here, in fact, you see beautiful photographs by Bourri, uh, uh, who, who, who took a campaign uh, just after the war. And you can see the state it was when it was a, a, a youth hostel and it was going to be demolished. Now, that villa was saved and it's now protected uh, for the future. But there are lots of other buildings that don't really fall within any given category nicely enough for those to be, as it were, safe. And we don't need to go into necessarily iconic buildings, but you know, if we go into the Brutalist period and we go into uh, uh, signature buildings, such as Robin Hood Garden Estate in, in, South, uh, in, in the east of London, uh, by uh, the Allison and Peter Smithson's partnership, which um, uh, is an interesting building in many ways, but of course has been left to decay, it's become a ghetto, and after a very, very lengthy campaign, it was deemed not to be listed, uh, and the building has been partly demolished. Part of it has been bought by the Victorian Albert Museum as an iconic piece of architecture to be kept. So part of it is now in a museum. But you can see between the preservation of this house and the preservation of that house, there isn't in fact a lot of difference when it comes to the debate around it. Uh, long story short, uh, the whole architectural uh, community, as it had done for the Villa Savoir, uh, uh, started shouting, including myself, uh, but uh, it was deemed not to be listed because it failed to meet the criteria around which it was originally conceived, uh, if you can believe it. So now what we discuss in this introductory module about the sort of cultural and, and philosophical and theoretical framework is to do with how do we manage the balance between those categories which naturally make a building worth preserving and those controversial instances which happens every day. And of course, we do need uh, to know what regulations there are, but it is all to do with interpretation. And those interpretations and everything depends, uh, depend on political, historical, fact, uh, uh, economic and so on. So the module is concerned with the 
historical and cultural aspects which affect this debate end with this idea of preserving the meanings and of the object themselves because what you will find is that regulations surrounding heritage depend on context and therefore the context is what prevails and therefore the object itself is in fact believe it or not the last bit of the jigsaw and so you need to know what it is that you are preserving and the symbols if you like associated to it uh, before you can even begin to understand what we are doing uh, and that in a nutshell is uh, about me and I can now stop sharing and I hope uh, to have given you just a little bit of the taste of what uh, comes. Any question for later, happy to answer. Later, yes, and uh, fascinating points, Manolo. Thank you very much. And uh, your uh, your uh, reference to uh, regulations actually naturally helps us to to now pass to the other companion module. We would say that all is also delivered in the autumn term by my colleague uh, Fiona Rayleigh, entitled uh, "Conservation in Action." So, Fiona, we are ready for some action. You're muted, Fiona. Just, just a minute. Turn, turn mute, That's then. right. I am off muted. Can you see that? Okay. Has it come up in a strange sort of format? Is that okay? Okay. Um, so apologies. Um, I don't have huge amounts of slides, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about this module because often people are put off by this module, um, thinking that it's all about the legislation of conservation and studying lots of law books and references. Whereas actually what we have decided to do with this module is actually set it out as being um, conservation in action is why do we have the legislation in place? What are the aspects around actually working in it day to day? And of course, uh, fortunately, I'm working in it for like 80 percent of the rest of my working week is actually doing projects and dealing with clients across a, a broad spectrum of projects. Um, so we also deal with, you know, why why is heritage at risk? Why does it need some kind of framework which then covers those three aspects of the ethical, the legislative and the administrative? So it's not just about studying the NPPF and other aspects of the law. And what we try to do is actually get you understanding um, why heritage at risk is important, why we need to do something to protect it, how the uh, framework of all these aspects works, um, what's in place, how it's useful, and obviously what the shortfalls are, so that you will have a fuller understanding of what it all means to conservation, rather than just being able to read um, the policies of a document, you would have a more thorough understanding of why, why they're there. Um, and in the initial weeks, we go on a variety of site visits to make sure that you're seeing what people are struggling with at this very point in time. So they're live projects usually with live clients. Um, and I'll just move on to the next slide. We can do that. No, it doesn't want me to do that bit. Um, so one of the sites that we go to is Fort Burgoyne down in Dover, which is a scheduled monument site, which is also listed. So it has all sorts of complexity. It's a former um, military site, which is now redundant and empty and vacant. So uh, looking for um, uses for that building is important to the client. But in the meantime, they need to get funding and they need to support maintaining the building and potentially meanwhile uses and keeping abreast of how much money they're spending on repairing the building, which is sort of gently decaying over time. Um, so, and it also has its relationship with the other um, elements in Dover and Dover as a particularly fascinating area at the moment and its conservation areas and the impact that it's having from changes over time. Um, so we go for a, a visit to that building and it's owned by the Land Trust and they kindly let us wander all throughout the catacombs of the building and look at the bats and the ecology. So not only are we looking at building legislation, we're looking at the associated elements that happen around conservation that we need to be aware of. 
We then take a lovely site visit to Chatham, to Chatham Intra, where we visit Chatham House, which has been awarded uh, about a million pounds worth of heritage funding through the High Street Heritage Action Zone for the whole of that area. And it's a catalyst for change within a very deprived area of the Medway towns. And the owner there has been wonderful in allowing us to see the building from um, before they started the works and next year we'll be going as they start to take on their first tenants um, and they've undertaken the most important elements of repair. There are associated buildings around the site which are still derelict and there are other projects that are getting funding in that high street. So we cover the elements of the um, High Street Heritage Action Zone, what it means, how it's being funded, how it's spanned out across the country to various elements, how clients can get assistance from Historic England, where the guidance documentation helps, and also the implications of the conservation area and the local authority. We're very lucky on this project to have a former student of this course, um, Ross, who was on the course about a year ago, and he is a conservation officer at Medway Borough Council, so he's been incredibly instrumental in helping us visit this site. He also ended up writing his dissertation on a nearby church that was at risk. So of course we cover the ecclesiastical exemption and we deal with the problems that churches mostly have at the moment of making a viable and sustainable future use. We also then look at um, Sheerness Dockyard Church, which is part of our visit, uh, which has been a building which has been at risk for well over 20 years. It suffered two massive fires in its lifetime and has ceased to become a church when the dockyard closed in the 1960s. It's now been um, reinvigorated by a new use as a community and arts venue. It will also house the historic um, dockyard model which is coming up from Portsmouth for the first time it'll be put back together and that project's been undertaken by Hugh Broughton with um, Martin Ashley as the conservation architect so we understand how these collaborations can work well and it's due to open I think in the next couple of weeks so we'll be seeing it hopefully in action from a cons construction site which we were climbing it last year with hard hats on and uh, up, up and down scaffold to a building that's actually got some use to it. Um, we also cover on this module, we cover World Heritage Sites, so we take forward um, the issues across the world and why that designation is applicable. Um, we cover the social, economic and political impact that is part of your day-to-day -day life if you join working into the heritage sector. And we also cover managing a heritage project when I talk about the work that I undertook with David Chipperfield on the Hotel Café Royal, which took four years to complete, and the current work that I'm working on for the Horniman Museum in South London with Field and Fowls, um, and also the project that I undertook for 10 Trinity um, with Orchid Swanky to make that into uh, another hotel from the Port of London Authority building. So we cover project management, contracts and all the associated elements that go together and the specialists, the kind of people that you'd be working with um, to make a project come together. Um, so it's a very diverse uh, project. We have a lot of fun. You do some role plays, you do some assignments, you produce your formative assignment based on heritage at risk, and then you will find a case study that you are interested in, and you will produce that and give us, uh, as a group, a presentation towards the end of term, which then turns into your formal assignment for this module. Um, so I want to sort of state that it's not all about reading law books, which is puts most people off when they join this module. It's about getting out there, seeing what it's like to be part of the sector, seeing the reality, talking to clients and understanding all those issues. Um, and if there are obviously any questions, then I'll be happy to answer them at the end. And I think that passes quite nicely on to my colleague um, Ron to talk about the, the more in-depth structural issues. So I'll stop sharing that one now. Thank you ever so much, Fiona. You've shown very clearly how you turned what can be a dry theoretical topic into something that uh, uh, provides an, an extra layer of engagement with uh, heritage. And all these planning, legislative, administrative issues are extremely important and extremely interesting uh, if you teach them that way through the engagement with the buildings and site visits. And I'm very glad that you highlighted the role of site visits uh, in our program. Um, thank you very much. Uh, now, 
we are shifting to to Ron. We are shifting from the autumn term to the spring term, where the focus changes. Um, we are looking at the technical aspect of conservation, um, and I'm sure that Ron will have much more to say about that. Uh, over to you, Ron. Okay. <coughs> uh, is this working? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Okay, so I'm uh, Ronald Yee. I am uh, a bridge architect and I specialize in the design and construction of long span structures. Um, I recently published the architecture of British bridges, uh, which was commissioned by uh, Crowwood Press. But prior to being an architect, I was an engineer in the army and so uh, more importantly, what it taught me was um, how things fall down. Um, I'm also involved in uh, conservation too, uh, especially iron bridges. And I'm a trustee of the Iron Bridge Society. And this is Benley Viaduct uh, in uh, Ilkeston. Uh, and my current research is on the early development of uh, lenticular trusses. I'm also uh, uh, writing uh, another book, which is primarily on weathering. Uh, and so I'm, I think I'm quite good, well placed for teaching you about structural appraisal. So structural appraisal uh, in the module, we tend to focus on uh, the structural study of traditional buildings. And through the module, you we will run through how we record a building through measured surveys so that you can produce your own set of uh, measured drawings, including sections and elevations. I'll also share with you some tips on uh, measuring inaccessible uh, objects through the use of trigonometry and by estimation uh, using uh, techniques that I learnt in the army. We'll also use more traditional uh, equipment, uh, such as the spirit level and rulers. Also in the module, we will have practical seminars on using the dumpy level. And you will also uh, have the opportunity to use, use uh, plain table surveying equipment to help you relate objects onto a plan. We will also uh, have practical seminars on photographic recording so that you can produce uh, elevations that are both uh, uh, realistic and accurate. And from that, you can trace and convert these uh, information into scale drawings. We will also have uh, practical seminars on how to use Photoshop to distort uh, or to correct photographic distortion and to produce panoramic photocomposite images that you can include into your report. But the key component of the module is the analysis of structural damage and trying to understand why damage occurs in the first place, which is key to uh, finding the remedy. Subsidence, for instance, can give us uh, telltale clues uh, by uh, leaving these uh, telltale cracks uh, that can help you get closer to the reason why the thing has occurred. We will also run through how we record that damage uh, through drawing, how we measure it in reality, both progressive and seasonal movement, which when uh, analysed will help you understand the nature of the faults. Pictures will also explain uh, the structural effects of natural loading and, oops, sorry, and in extreme cases I will explain how to prevent buildings from falling down. Or, and certainly I will tell you how to uh, recognise when you have to call in the experts. You'll get lectures are, and seminars on traditional building methods, and we will also go into the natural decay through weathering, which is my speciality, and infestation. 
And we will also see uh, through site visits how uh, structures can be remediated and conserved. And because of our links with the, uh, the cathedral, you'll get a chance to actually go to the mason's yard and see for yourself how difficult it is to reproduce uh, these items. OK, so uh, in our module, you will have to produce a report in which you choose uh, your own case study building. And then you do some research and describe the history, the geology underneath the building, the vernacular in which uh, the building sits and the phasing are uh, through over time. Then you will survey the building so that you have an accurate record uh, of the state of the building. And then uh, you will analyze uh, the faults that you find. And this will be done uh, in class. So you won't be kind of left in the, uh, 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 the lurch. We will discuss this. And so by the time you get to write your report, you will have a fair idea as to what's wrong with the building and what the remedies are. And the final and most important part of the, the report is that you will uh, make your or schedule out your recommendations uh, in order of priority. So you see uh, that this module is a bit more uh, hands on -y and uh, out and about uh, and practical than other modules, but I'm sure uh, you will enjoy it. Please don't be scared about the term structures. It really is. We only touch the principles and we don't go into formula. Thank you very much. And over to you, Nikos. Thank you very much, uh, Ron. And actually, listening to your presentation, I was thinking that uh, this focus on structures is, um, is, is really, even though it might be a daunting topic, especially if it's something that is outside one's original area of expertise, actually the overview we give actually liberates someone and opens so many new possibilities of understanding buildings and understanding why they evolved the way they did. So one of the characteristics, I think, of the program is also the overlap between the modules. So structural considerations presented by Ron are directly connected with the principles outlined by Manolo and the questions, the philosophical questions that Manolo said. And also all this is, of course, both structure and the philosophy are directly feed into policy and uh, the administrative aspect that, that Fiona um, uh, presented. And one of the characteristics of the program is that we know our field, but we also know uh, the other fields as well. And we try to draw from them in order to enrich the discussion uh, rather than making it, uh, you know, a, a sterile, sclerotic, um, um, isolated in in investigation of individual topics. I think we think that actually these overlaps and um, the cross fertilization between topics uh, is where the opportunities lie. And that is the premise for perhaps an atypical module for a conservation program. Um, it's very rare to find a module that is devoted to actual intervention and the design of uh, intervention projects. Um, uh, this is something unique that characterizes our programs. It gives the students the opportunity to design an intervention at a historic site, which is chosen every year. Um, this is the core of the module entitled Intervention at Historic Sites, which takes place uh, during the spring term. And I'm going to present this uh, to give you some information about this uh, straight as soon as I can share my screen. I hope that you can all see this. Um, I'd like to start by uh, saying a few words about what we mean by intervention at historic buildings. In essence, the module explores all possible uh, kinds of development affecting historic buildings. Um, acts of preservation, just prevention of their deterioration, consolidation, just some structural repair to um, reinforce these buildings to prevent um, any kind of decay from happening, um, uh, interventions that may aim to improve the energy efficiency of a building through the addition of insulation, for instance. Rehabilitation is associated with interventions um, changing the use of the building and uh, introducing a new use that perhaps adapts to the fabric of the building. Uh, intervention can be quite extensive and can be quite intrusive 
without being directly condemned. We, uh, restoration sometimes or reconstruction is the only way forward for actually using the building or instead um, avoiding its loss. Um, and this became apparent recently with uh, the catastrophic event uh, fire that uh, consumed much of the fabric of the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Uh, this cathedral is now uh, reconstructed. So uh, a conservation program like ours cannot ignore the massive skills and knowledge that is required for such interventions, and we teach them. Um, let me give you a closer idea about different uh, techniques and methods that we investigate. We start from a very low-key uh, but uh, strategic moves to make sure that historic buildings can be enjoyed by future generations. And we, of course, uh, we follow the maxim of the conservation movement that to preserve is better than to restore, and we try to um, highlight all those methods that enable us to prevent the deterioration of historic structures, such as the control of plant growth and buildings, or the removal of damaging factors uh, that bring decay, such as, for instance, the proximity of a railway line to historic monument. Two examples here, the plants uh, that are being removed from uh, the uh, one of the facades of Christchurch Gate in Canterbury, and the railway line causing vibrations that affect the sixth century uh, Church of St. Saint Sergius Saint and Bacchus in Istanbul, now the Kichika Yesofia uh, journey. Um, all these measures aim to prevent the deterioration of the building. Um, however, there are other uh, methods that do not, uh, do not alter the fabric of the building, but uh, help to actually prevent uh, its further deterioration, such as the desalination. And uh, we learn a lot from the experience of the technicians working in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in, in Paris, uh, who are using um, desalination methods to remove the salts that enter the structure when um, uh, the firefighters actually injected enormous amounts of water into the building, perhaps a lesser known aspect of the current reconstruction of this great monument. Moving on in terms of intensity, we're looking at techniques of consolidation. And as you may have gathered, we learn from case studies. We study the reports published and the drawings published, or actually we visit monuments to see the measures taken to um, improve their current state. And some of those measures are related with what we call consolidation, uh, anything related to a structural intervention to prevent further decay or to address some structural damage as indeed illustrated by the insertion of this metal frame in the doorway of this uh, Frankish tower built on Hellenistic remains in the ancient town of Trizina in Greece. Um, energy efficiency improvement is also part of uh, the different types of intervention. It's also one of the types of intervention one um, may expect to find in a historic uh, building. And uh, it has become of greater and greater importance uh, the more we're trying to meet uh, the current strategies for um, uh, against climate change. So um, the, this is very important because energy efficiency improvements can be very detrimental to historic structures unless they're carefully designed and planned. So we are actually using cutting edge research to actually teach our students the uh, right way in order to improve the energy credentials of historic buildings. Uh, we moving on further into more, uh, let's say, interventionist approaches to historic buildings, we look at restoration. Um, we like to choose case studies that are controversial and open opportunities for debate, such as uh, that related with the Temple E in Selinunte. Uh, in uh, Sicily, which is in a very interesting project of the, in the night carried out in the 1950s, which involved the addition of um, uh, precast uh, cement concrete elements in order to complete uh, parts of the ruined fabric of this wonderful um, uh, temple, which is situated in the wonderful uh, site of Selinunte. Again, there's a lot of discussions related with the choice of materials, the technique, of introducing them to the structure and their impact on the structure itself. And we like to compare examples, the one with the other, just in order to understand uh, the different methods and techniques involved. So for instance, uh, we can compare the previous image with 
uh, the, this photograph, which shows the anastylosis of uh, part of the Asclepian of Epidaurus uh, in Greece, which is a wonderful uh, classical and Hellenistic and Roman sites in the Peloponnese in Greece. Um, we examine all those examples quite in depth. And as you see, we're not limited chronologically so much. So unlike other uh, programs where the focus is clearly on uh, early modern and recent monuments, we actually extend our remit to include ancient monuments and medieval monuments because we believe that they form an invaluable part of our heritage and they require the specialist skills of an expert in architectural conservation. So we learn from the experts uh, quite in depth, all those techniques involved uh, in the uh, intervention at historic sites. Um, regarding rehabilitation, which, as we said, involves change of use, uh, we start with exploring a controversial example, the work of Carlos Scarpa in the Castel Vecchio Museum at Verona, an example where rehabilitation had a, an ideological and philosophical agenda, which is very interesting to explore. I think it's an ideal example to develop one's own approach and strategies towards uh, intervention at historic sites. And of course, we're looking at all those skills and methods and designs that are related with reconstruction, a very important topic. Uh, and we uh, explore several reconstruction projects quite in depth. One of them uh, is the current project currently underway in uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in, uh, in Paris, um, which gives an amazing opportunity to investigate in depth all those methods uh, which are related with traditional craftsmanship and aim to restore uh, a major historic monument um, uh, to its original form as close as possible to its pre-destruction form. So this has yielded enormous amount of material that is extremely instructive. The core of the module, though, is the student work itself. So every time we work on a live project uh, on a historic site chosen in Kent, and I can give you some examples of sites we've chosen in the past, what you see in this image is the work of one of our students back in 2015. Um, it's a proposal for the adaptive reuse of the Sheerness Dockyard Church, an incredible 19th century church, uh, which was sadly destroyed by fire on several occasions, the last one of which actually gutted the original structure or the, its, uh, and uh, it's uh, situated in a deprived area. This monument was a challenge regarding uh, its future. So our students actually visited the monument, uh, surveyed it in detail, and provided some ideas that were designed uh, in depth. So um, you see some examples of their work here. Um, more recently, from 2019 onwards, we have been working on uh, a medieval and early modern monument um, uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. I just presented it earlier. It's St. Andrew's Chapel in Maidstone which I showed, and I show it to you not in a photograph, but what you see in your screens right now is a laser scan uh, of this building. Um, and this is related with the conditions in which the module was delivered in 2020. We were in the middle of a pandemic, so it was very difficult to have access to the sites. So laser scanning offered the opportunity for the students to actually get to understand the building remotely but also to engage with a tool for the survey of buildings that is more and more important. However, we aim when possible to actually visit the buildings and explore them uh, in, in a close, from close. Um, work of our students on this building has included the analysis of its historic phases and the mapping of their significance, as you can see in this image. It's the work of our student, Joel Hopkinson. Uh, and it went into proposals for uh, extension of the buildings, repairs, consolidation. Uh, it varies depending on the problem of the historic site we're looking at. So survey is very much part of this module, but also uh, proposal specification of repairs and proposals for extensions of those buildings. And this module is flexible, enabling each student to actually orient their conservation plan uh, according 
to their original background. So you have the option of developing a repair schedule and specifying repairs in writing uh, or using photographs or comparing it with other buildings. Or if you have an architectural background, you're given the opportunity to uh, propose uh, to design the intervention, as you can see here. And what has surprised me during the teaching of this module is that sometimes students from different backgrounds choose to actually investigate an aspect outside their original background. They see this module as an opportunity to learn new skills. Uh, remaining in St. Andrew's Chapel, this example of student work by our, our current student, Sean Broomhead, actually shows you how the same chapel can actually be extended in order to be reused as a school of traditional building methods and craftsmanship, uh, making the fabric of the extension part of the teaching material. Indeed, the fabric of the extension designed by these students enables uh, the future students of this school to actually learn from different parts of the structure. So it illustrates uh, the conservation methods it seeks to disseminate, which I thought is a very, very interesting idea. And I'm always surprised by the work of the students in this module, always in engagement with a live project, usually under the guidance of the experts working on the project, as in this case, the, uh, the technical, uh, the technicians of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. Um, I will move on because uh, with the final module in the program, which is dissertation, uh, which takes place typically in the summer term, and which gives our students the opportunity to explore an aspect of conservation of their own choice. And I'd like to emphasize the word choice here, because um, it is very common uh, for dissertations to have the rigid form of a 15,000 word essay. But the module specification uh, shows, as, as the module specification shows, we've chosen a more flexible path, giving our students the opportunity to choose different dissertation formats, depending on their interests. Uh, and the different formats correspond to different topics. We accept that 15,000 words is not the only pathway to dissertation, even though for many students it may be the preferred pathway. So students have the opportunity to write less, and introduce a drawing component or a survey component, providing a structural report, or indeed to make design one of the key aspects of the dissertation. They have the opportunity to design an intervention at a historic site. Uh, let me give you some examples of recent dissertations just to highlight the variety that we welcome and encourage. Um, our student, Baylor Colton, in uh, 2022, um, chose a very interesting topic, which is the 19th century conservation of parish churches in Kent. Um, those churches usually date back to the Middle Ages, uh, and they are known and understood as medieval monuments, even though a great part of their fabric actually is much more recent. Uh, mapping those recent repairs uh, is, it was a great part of Mailer's work and actually showed that um, this adds to the importance of those buildings, our understanding of the different aspects of their fabric and the role of 19th century restorers in their creation only enriches our understanding of these buildings. This was very much a theoretical dissertation. However, um, the, that, the work of Stephen Tyson one year earlier, I believe, um, was not your typical theoretical essay, but it was a conservation plan that uh, made recommendations for the development of a major Georgian building in Ramsgate, in the port of Ramsgate. Uh, the clock house is a stunning building. Um, the, Steve's work included uh, archival research, which actually um, revealed the original designs for the building that you see in the upper left corner. And his work also involved the creation of 3D models, uh, survey models of the structure, which helped him to understand its significance, but helped him also as a background on which to specify repairs and to map actually his proposals for intervention uh, into uh, at this building. Uh, so far, I've, we've talked a lot about buildings, but we also have uh, we follow the declaration of uh, Amsterdam in 1975, uh, which actually showcased the importance of conservation in the urban realm, um, the importance of 
not looking at buildings in an isolated way, but looking at historic sites, the historic sites they form part of. So we cultivate this to a great extent and we make our students aware of historic urban structures and the role of context uh, in our appreciation of historic sites. And perhaps it was following that strand uh, of emphasis of our program that uh, Ross Crayford uh, actually developed uh, a dissertation that is looking at the rejuvenation of historic urban industrial areas like Chatham Intra. Um, this is very much overlapping with uh, Ross's work and background. He's a planner uh, based in, uh, in Chatham, and Chatham Intra and its conservation plan is one of his um, professional uh, areas of interest. So he studied very much the history of industrial areas like Chatham Intra, he mapped their significance, and he proposed a new conservation plan as part of his dissertation. So a dissertation is an opportunity to cultivate an aspect of the program a little bit further, study it in more depth, but also it is a stepping stone for what you intend to do after the program. And all the tutors of the program, uh, Manolo, Fiona, Ron, and I are here to support you uh, in this, preparing you for the uh, after, for, for your steps after the program. Uh, the dissertation is, um, is taught in uh, weekly tutorials that take place during the summer term, and it's submitted at the end of the academic year, uh, at the end of August. So I hope that this provides uh, a good overview of what our program offers and its individual modules. I'd like now to open the table for discussion. Uh, so if our, um, our guests would like to ask any questions, we're very delighted to answer them. So uh, it's, it's over to you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for all uh, your presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, I have some questions. The first one is I understand that there are many study cases in different models. And I wanted to know if uh, after the students work, some maybe the client uh, use the study case to um, preserve the monument or if it's just for school and just to learn how it works. Uh, thank you so much, Valentin, because that gives me an opportunity to, to highlight another aspect. Yes, of course, we case studies that you choose during your studies in all modules, um, we hope that they may have an impact later on. And we not only uh, allow that, we encourage this. Um, we, we will be very happy if we know that part of the work you carried out during one of the modules of the program can be used as a basis for something that makes a positive contribution to the historic environment. Let me give you an example. Uh, one of my current students is actually surveying, as part of her dissertation, um, is actually surveying a, a derelict 19th century church in northern Greece in a very, very inaccessible site. Um, she has, uh, we have helped her get in contact with the local authorities, and they're very much interested in actually using this work as a basis for the future conservation or restoration of the monument, in which this student hopes to be involved later on. So yes, of course, uh, we we would like, we'll, that's why we choose like projects, and we very much encourage interactions with the users of buildings and those that manage them. I think we had um, we had a text that I'm not sure if I can see. Ah, yes, the chat. If I switch the chat, there was a question sent. Um, uh, we have a question from uh, Mariam that was answered in the chat by Manolo. Am I right, Manolo? Uh, the, can I read the question? It says, hello, thank you for your time. I was wondering what are our employability chances and challenges? Can I work as a researcher or continue in the academic field with this degree? And um, uh, Manolo, I think, uh, gave a very good, uh, succinct answer to this regarding the PhD opportunities, isn't it, Manolo? Yes, uh, the, the course really is, first of all, is designed to assist anybody with any background without prior knowledge. 
And we do have historically a very varied uh, a range of students, age, demographics, provenance, and it's a very international cohort, as indeed is the staff group uh, teaching it. Um, so it's designed to offer a kind of 360 degree uh, introduction to the, to, the, to, the, to anything pertaining heritage. And as you saw, you go from the theoretical framework to very specific leg leg legal and technical and intervention aspects to it. But a good number of our students in the masters then continue uh, with uh, a PhD research on it. Uh, other students come from the professional background and then develop projects talking about what Valentin was also uh, uh, mentioning, uh, bringing direct impact of what they learn into their own uh, specific uh, projects. Uh, so uh, the challenges and opportunities are uh, as many as in any field. But what this module provides you with is all kind of aspects from the theoretical to the very practical related to a very broad uh, theme, which we call heritage, but heritage is to do with learning how to read heritage and, and, and building environments, learning how to intervene upon them, learning how to deal at a kind of legal, uh, political and, and technical level. So whichever, uh, whatever you want to do with it, you'll have a lot of uh, avenues uh, open. And certainly the research and academic side is very much part of it. Absolutely. That's a very, very good uh, <clears throat> point, uh, Manolo. And uh, in, in also re uh, response to Mariam's uh, question, let me give you some examples of what former graduates are doing now. So many of them are planning officers right now. There is a steady demand for uh, planning officers that are responsible for conservation uh, in the UK. Um, and our program is actively uh, uh, collaborating with local authorities here in Kent in the training of their planning officers. So one of our current students is a, a trainee planning officer, and we also work with uh, um, uh, Dover Council and Canterbury City Council. So we have very good links with the councils in the area and uh, in the training of their conservation officers, but we are also open to people who would like to apply to conservation officer roles that are advertised to us, and we forward these to our students. So this is one of the pathways. Um, we have students, current PhD students, as Manola mentioned, are graduates of our program, and indeed many of them have progressed after their PhD and are lecturers in academia. Uh, after a successful period of PhD research. Um, part of, many of our students work in architectural practices, specializing in conservation projects, but uh, that is not a role that's only limited to architects. We have archeologists who, uh, through our program, uh, through the knowledge that they got from our program, they collaborate with architectural practices as conservation consultants, which is a growing uh, market and field, if you like the more the architectural practice focuses on existing building, the greater the demand for conservation specialists that work closely with architects in uh, big projects affecting historic buildings. So these are just uh, three or four streams uh, it, that uh, are open to our graduates following the completion of the program, which really hopes to open many different doors of engagement with heritage uh, and uh, increase the possibilities of professional involvement with the development of historic buildings and sites. Yeah, one more thing to say, Nikos, is that this course, whether one takes it as a year long full time or a two year part time, is also a very good hub for networking, not only among students that come from different backgrounds, a lot of whom with professional affiliations, uh, but also we have external guests coming from all sorts of fields, delivering lectures, participating and contributing uh, from our association with uh, the Canterbury Cathedral to all sorts of amenities, societies and academies that we draw expertise uh, from. So students that have come either from uh, changes in their careers or 
or continuation in a similar field have then been able to use this as a forum to further develop their connections and networking. So in this respect, there is a lot to take uh, from it uh, as well. Excellent points, the networking aspects, uh, um, because we deliver it in collaboration, so you get to interact with many heritage professionals, a very wide range of them, yeah. and indeed con contribute to conservation projects. The other day that I visited St. Andrew's uh, uh, Chapel in Maidstone, I realized that uh, the local team is always remembering the contribution of one of our students to the building, to the actual repair of the building. So they pointed some details that she had carried out a volunteering during a, a, a conservation party that involved uh, actual work on the monument. So it's a, it's, it's a multi-layered engagement with current conservation activities and interaction with experts that actually gives you these professional pathways, makes them more accessible to you. Any other uh, questions? There was another question. Ah. So, gave uh, In fact, I should say that in many ways, uh, uh, those that do not have preconceived knowledge about uh, about a topic are always best placed to learn and absorb all the complexities. But equally, that wouldn't exclude those that do come from uh, a similar backgrounds and may not have experienced, for instance, the academic side of it or a certain aspect of the legal or technical or intervention, because the field is really as broad as you can imagine. And the module and modules and the course overall uh, are designed to cater for all. So I wouldn't worry at all, uh, Marion. And there was a last question yes. ah, in yes. terms so of preparation. And Nikos, Nikos can perhaps address that. Absolutely. And I would I would think that I would say that it's never too early, Marion, to uh, it's or too late indeed to study conservation and you shouldn't worry at all. Um, it is our, our program is open to, to students of varied backgrounds and stages in life. And we are here to support you, not only through our program, but through the university, which is very much bring all those people together and make it's a community that mutually supports its members. So I think that uh, you should feel very comfortable and not not be daunted by, by the program. Instead, you should see it as a platform for opportunity and something that's really enjoyable. Um, there is a last question by Mariam. Um, yes. What would you advise us to read or learn to prepare us for the program? That's a very good question, a very topical one, Marion, because I'm planning to send all applicants of our program uh, a, a reading list, a reading list and some instructions on how to prepare during the summer months for our September, late September start of the program. So you will get a comprehensive reading list uh, depending on your background. This reading list is thematic. So depending on your background, it will you may want to venture to look at books that complete your existing understanding, and that reading list will, will help you. There are some core text books that we always recommend. For instance, I, I found that uh, Giuca Giochiletto's History of Conservation is actually a very lovely introduction, and I recommend it whenever I'm asked as a first, let's say, uh, portal of entry into the field. Bernard Fielden's uh, Conservation of Historic Buildings is also a, a very good um, textbook that shows you the various aspects of cons conservation. Uh, Giorgio Croce's book on structural conservation helps you understand the structural aspect uh, of it. Um, any, but the best preparation really, apart from reading a little bit about it, is going out there and engaging with architectural history and heritage and visiting buildings, there's so much to be learned by visiting historic buildings and trying to look at them with a forensic, let's say, view and try to understand them, try to understand the phases of construction, try to engage with historic forms uh, and also trying to see what it is, what is it that you like coming to the program with some idea of what you would like to explore helps you use the resources we make available to you and trace your own pathway through the field. So I hope that gives you some original, some very introductory uh, cursory pointers. 
and uh, it will only be followed by a more detailed reading list very, very shortly. So if you've already applied, you will receive it. If you have not, please contact me and I'm very happy to respond, to send it to you directly, uh, responding to your message. Thank you, Nikos. Just one last thing, if I may add, yes, of uh, we, of course, run these events uh, 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 and then we'll make them available to everybody. But, uh, uh, you know, this is an open conversation and perhaps through Nikos, who manages the program, uh, you can indeed request or get in touch with us uh, because each of us will be would be very happy to recommend specific aspects, really catered around your own questions because your backgrounds are different. Uh, and so, you know, don't feel shy or do not see as this event is it and then we'll perhaps see each other in September because that's not what it is intended to be. Master's courses are generally a, a kind of medium size, a very kind of uh, intense kind of cohort where you know, you basically establish a one to one uh, uh, relationship with your own tutors and, and peers. So, you know, you can start now and come back with any question, because I find myself in my instance, for instance, that, you know, after I've had a bit of time to think about what I've heard, then I've got so many more questions. Uh, and so please do come back because this is very useful dialogue. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Manolo. And uh, uh, is there any any final question? Yeah. yeah, yeah, please. I just have a quick question uh, about the legislation uh, course. Yes. I just want to know if this course are just about the UK or maybe more European uh, studies or NLO or things like that. I think this is a question for Fiona, but I may have something to say about that too. No. <laughs> Our focus English, UK or European? It's definitely or focused Russia. on it's definitely focused on the UK because that's part of what the validation is by the Institute of Historic Building Conservation. So you get that validity of the course through uh, you know, a very influential conservation um, community here in the UK. But we do cover the World Heritage sites. We also cover the international charters, which I know my colleagues will also talk about. But in terms of, you know, the, the workability, it is based on the UK because we're following the criteria that gets validated. May I add to this? Yeah, exactly that. Um, so it has to, to focus on UK planning and legislation, um, uh, which is, I must say, it's, it's a very uh, mature and very highly developed and inspirational system, uh, despite our critical approach to it, uh, we, we feel that it provides a wonderful opportunity to understand um, the, the availability of, of planning uh, frameworks that enable conservation to happen and historic buildings to be preserved. And we found in the past that the historic, the, the planning system in the UK, it, by, by engaging with it, you can draw lessons and information and materials that are relevant, even if you're going to work outside the UK, there are uh, parallels and there are comparable measures. If you're coming from a different system, uh, from a different background or a different place where other uh, systems are in place, um, you may find it very interesting to actually learn from the planning system uh, in, in the UK. And if later in your dissertation, for instance, you might choose to study the provisions that the legal and planning provisions elsewhere. There is this international element through international uh, charters. And I must state that in general, uh, our program is very much international. So we draw upon a very wide range of heritage. I think you saw that in the examples I presented uh, as, as parts, for instance, of the inter intervention module, or indeed Manolo and Ron uh, showed many different examples from sites all around uh, Europe. So it's really, we draw upon uh, European heritage um, and wide range, as wide range of buildings as possible. And we make references, of course, to theories that go beyond those expressed in the UK. We're looking at conservation theories that were published elsewhere. So it's a very international kind of outlook that also reflects our own 
areas of, of expertise. Well, uh, I, w I was going to say, if I could just step in very briefly as we are running out of time, but Valentin, uh, uh, I, my training in historic building was done in Paris as far as the Monuments Historiques. And I worked all over France and I come from a background, if I can give you a little bit of information, uh, that it really sits across Europe. Uh, so I have been involved with projects in the Italian context, where I'm, I'm from Rome, in the French context, as I uh, lived and worked in Paris, and in the English context, where I've been living for half of my life. And, and I can tell you, you basically end up having, first of all, an attitude that sort of sits in between all of these things, because there is a legal and technical and bureaucratic framework, which is specific to the country, more or less related to the kind of history and attitudes they have towards the discipline. Yes, and Fr France, for instance, is very highly regulated. The English system is regulated in a different way, but compared to systems such as the French one, seems not regulated at all, and yet it is. The Italians are, have got their own idiosyncrasies, uh, uh, within which there's a lot of difference in between uh, the northern and, and sort of central and southern Italy kind of attitude. If you go to Greece, it's a yet a different time. So, my module, for instance, is about drawing all of these idiosyncratic and different attitudes on the table and, and reflect where we see it. And so it's not specific to one country or another country or another country, but it is specific to how we solve the problem. Now, the very project of restoration and part, largely reconstruction of Notre Dame is not a French project, it's a worldwide led uh, intervention. And so to answer your question is yes, when it comes to individually uh, 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 projects such as this chapel of that building or the other building, because you need to operate within that infrastructure. But no, because the way you actually tackle the issue is not ever nationally led and it cannot be. It's much broader than that, you see. Uh, certainly a kind of a philosophical level. So uh, I think, if anything, it, you would be enriched by working within a certain type of infrastructure, which is governed by national uh, attitudes, so that then you see how these sit in between uh, uh, the various stances, you see, uh, of other countries. And if it's France, the country you are involved with, then 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 will give you a completely different perspective. So so it's, it's something that actually would enrich you, I think, uh, uh, greatly. OK, thank you very much for your answer. Wonderful. Well, I think that uh, this is a good way to close uh, this uh, presentation, this overview of the program. I hope that those who attended it found it interesting. And uh, I think uh, the, the last words couldn't be other than please keep in touch. Uh, let us know if there is any projects you have in mind, any interests. Uh, we're here to he hear from you and to engage with, with your ideas about the programs, answer any questions. We know it's difficult when it comes to choosing a program or your next step. So we're here to advise you. Uh, and in the meantime, if you would like to uh, uh, explore the program further, uh, what better way to do it than hear from the students themselves who write about their experiences of the program uh, in uh, the blog, which is called Architectural Conservation at Kent. I think a simple search would actually give you access uh, to, to the blog. If not, please let me know and I will send you a link. So. Thank you very much for joining me and thank you to my colleagues for uh, the wonderful uh, panoramic view of the program and your modules that you provided. And I hope that we will all of us uh, meet again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. So we can put the presentation on our social channels and etc., which has been recorded. And any you other question, to... including practical questions to students, it, you know, all sorts, accommodation, visas, whatever, do come back as we can obviously uh, provide assistance with that. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone.